Hey everyone, this is Mike Dolphson from the Microsoft Education Team. Thanks for joining us today on the webinar, Remote Learning with Microsoft EDU. And we've got two great guests today, a double header interview. So here's the agenda. I'll give the latest news and updates. We've got Michelle Free, General Manager of the Education Experiences Team. And also we've got Jonathan Briggs from Eastside Prep. And we're going to hear a lot of great stuff from both of them. Just to review our three top quick links to get started. Make sure to visit the Microsoft EDU main remote learning website, the Teams EDU quick start guide, which is actually getting updated very soon with even more useful information. And then make sure to sign up for the Teams remote learning community. And we are all working together on the Microsoft education team with customers from all around the world, answering questions. People are learning from each other and we're able to help schools that are moving rapidly into this new world of education. So for today's updates, a couple of top news items here. We've got a brand new on the Microsoft Education Center, our social and emotional learning page, some great tips and tricks around how to check in with students. Social emotional learning is really critical during this phase, especially with students who are at home and not with all their peers and educators like they normally are. So there's a great new resource there. We also just launched all of these remote learning webinars we've been recording and we just put them out on a YouTube playlist as of yesterday, I believe. So here's a link. Any of these that you miss or if there's people in your school that want to watch some of the past webinars we've done, they're all on YouTube in a playlist now and this webinar will be posting there probably tomorrow morning. And lastly, yesterday, Alice Keeler and Rachel Berger did a great webinar on IEPs and 504, so special education with Microsoft Learning Tools and how to do that in a remote environment. And that webinar is also posted on YouTube and that's fully consumable right now. So those are our top three updates. But now we're going to get to Michelle Freed and Jonathan Briggs. They are our two guests today. And Michelle, we're going to start with Michelle. So Michelle is the general manager of the Education Experiences team. She also happens to be my manager and we've worked together for many years and it's really great to have her on today to talk about Microsoft's response to the COVID crisis because Michelle is essentially helping run the entire effort across Microsoft Education and how we're trying to help out the world and make sure everyone can, can get with remote learning and distance learning as necessary. So Michelle, we're going to switch over and we're going to do a little interview now. So you ready? I'm ready. OK, so you're helping coordinate the overall Microsoft response to COVID-19 for education. What are the top things that you've been seeing and hearing around the globe as you've been talking with educators and schools everywhere about this? Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, so first of all, I want to thank everyone who's watching this because you're likely an educator or school leader that's in the middle of, of supporting your students and your families. Uh, your educators and staff. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, one of the key things I'm hearing about from parents especially is how much they appreciate what you're doing. So thank you. Um, the first thing that we're seeing from leaders like you is you're starting with food and safety. Uh, before even thinking about the learning, you're taking care of your communities and making sure that people can get fed because for many of you, especially those that might be K-12, or higher education where your students are in the dormitories, taking care of their, their, their needs is first and foremost, and so thank you. Uh, the other thing that I'm seeing is just so much bravery and creativity and grit and the ability to learn and adjust. If you think about the 21st century skills that you want your students to have, you are leading by example, so that's fantastic. Um, I've also really seen how much leadership makes a difference whether you're the Minister of Education, um, we've seen leadership there in places like Italy and United Emirates where they've really taken a, a very proactive role in helping their countries prepare uh, to leaders like those in LAUSD who stepped back and looked at these this big, big moonshot, hence the moon behind me, um, uh, of a problem and you've just kind of gone right in it to individual educators who have tried to put things together even if their school doesn't have a program. And it's really that leadership that we have seen has made such a big difference for the communities and the stu students. The other thing Mike I'm hearing is 
oh my gosh, so many amazing stories, which we can hopefully get into later. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's there is a lot of amazing things happening uh, all around the world. So if a school is thinking about shifting to remote learning right now, what are your top pieces of advice? They're like, okay, I need to move right now, Michelle. What should we do? Well, we've seen schools move in a day, so it's definitely possible. Um, I think the first thing you, you need to start with is to think about the reasons that you, lots of people tell you you can't do it, right? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, for years we see people have wanted to do digital transformation and there's all these stoppers along the way. We've had some customers work with for two years and are just getting started. Um, but focus on the yes, we can, because we have seen the what, what people have thought the impossible actually happen. Um, you know, don't worry about being perfect, right? I mean, that's one of the things that I think is that is that why we can't. It's got to be perfect and exactly the same for uh, homogeneous across across your district. Um, but what we've actually seen in practice is most schools, and I'm sure you're going to hear, you know, in the, in the next set is, you know, what you do even the first couple days is different than the next couple days, and then you will adjust the next week based upon what your community really needs um, as part of that. Now. A key to this is communication. So the schools we've seen most successful, they over communicate. You can't communicate enough. Um, so it's whether or not the superintendent is sending out a note every night to all their constituents, uh, the principal to their staff, uh, the educators to their students, so people know what to expect, especially if things are going to change from day to day it has been super uh, important. The other thing is that, you know, just like in face to face, students learn differently. You'll find the same thing when they're remote. Um, you might have the quietest kid in the class is all of a sudden now your most vocal person because they're really comfortable with the chat aspects of it. Um, you will also find that sometimes even the most chatty, the chatty kids got a little bit shy when they, when they need to do things. So the teachers and the educators might need to modify a little bit as they're learning. Um, the other thing is building breaks and screen time. Uh, we've seen a lot of schools, and this is why they'll, they'll change, is they, they try to do exactly what they're doing when they're analog and face-to-face, -face, and um, that doesn't work, you know, especially for the younger kids. Having them in front of a screen for all the, that time isn't going to work for them. I know even for, for myself and my team, spending hours in front of a screen can be hard. Um, Think about BYID. So often I've seen people say, well, you know, it's got to be, you know, this particular device for them to use. All they need is a web browser, right? They can do it on a tablet. They can do it on a phone. We even have schools that the students are using their Xboxes at home because they might have three or four kids at home and they don't have enough, you know, devices there. All you need is a browser. Just remember that. Be creative if you don't have good um, internet connections in your in your community. What about local cable? We have one school that's using radio to broadcast uh, their lessons that are there. Um, there's way, many ways that you can actually share uh, media later. The other thing is really ask and learn for help from others. As Mike said, the community is a great place, but there's likely leaders and school districts in your area that, you, that can help you. We've seen that happen with people that are more prepared, reaching out and helping doing professional development from others. And the other thing is assume your network is not perfect. You think about the fact that you're trying to go online, so is the restaurant down the street and the large company um, down the street or the next city over. And so you know, the Internet is actually getting a lot of traffic right now and your peak times in your country or in your area, you're going to want to have backup plans. Well, actually, I, I relate personally to the last one you talk about as, as all my great producers, uh, you know, Marilyn and Matt and Bryce know, I actually am hardwired to my router and my cable modem in my mudroom because I've had all sorts of internet problems. And I can see right now I'm getting a, your network is bad and my voice is always dropping out. So yeah, that's that's just a fact of life. And, yeah. and you just have to get creative, I agree. Um, so Microsoft talks a lot about being growth mindset and we talk a lot about uh, being a learning organization. So what are the top learnings you've had in the past couple of weeks as you've been, we've been evolving through everything it's happening well i think the number one is get your eight hours of sleep or whatever sleep you need um because in order for you to serve your community serve your communities if you're not healthy and rested you can't help them uh i was reminded of this and watched the ted talk i didn't have time to to read the why we sleep book um uh and it's it's pretty eye-opening especially in this time if you don't get the right amount of sleep your immune system is down and if you get sick 
you can't help others. And so I think that's really kind of a, a key learning for me. Um, you know, how we've thought about remote is very different when 100% of everything is remote. Um, uh, I work at the corporate headquarters of Microsoft, and uh, we are a few miles away from Kirkland, Washington, which was the epicenter of COVID in, when it hit the United States. So even though we had been working with uh, our schools around the world for COVID, it became very different for us when we were all remote as well, trying to help all of you be remote. And so uh, that kind of changed how you know, we think about it and changed how I think we're, we're going to prioritize our products in the future. So just an example, if you think about any video software today, we uh, focus on the person that's speaking. Well, what if I speaking with sign language? There's not that cue there to get the video. And so there's like little things like that that we're learning. Or um, what does recess look like um, from a digital perspective? And so that's, I think, you know, a key learning. Um, I also, you know, I'm constantly striving to be better today than I was tomorrow. And so I'm looking very much at not like, what do we need to do three weeks from now or three months from now? It's like, what do we need to do tomorrow to be better than we were today? Um, and then I talked a little about sitting in front of the screen. Don't make your kids do it for eight hours a day. And then there's a great quote from Maya Angelou that I think about often is, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel in this type of an environment. And so I think about that almost every day. That's, that's a great quote. That's definitely, uh, that's exactly probably how we'll all look back on this uh, five, 10, 20 years from now. Exactly. Now, so as the global coordination person who's on point for all of Microsoft education, I think some of the folks out there would be really interested for some sort of the inside stories. Give us some inside stories that you can share anyways with the audience and, and what's been going on. Sure, ha happy to. So our education response team is a cross company effort with the product teams like that Mike and I um, are in that are building the education experiences. It's our marketing teams, our communication team, our field teams are representatives from the US and around the world, our product support teams, our community efforts, our Microsoft stores uh, from the US, our partner teams that work with partners and we meet every day. Um, and uh, one of the, the key things about that is, you know, we don't usually meet every day together for a long time. We, we coordinate with each other, but not on a daily basis. And so the relationships have deepened. And, and I think often about when you bring a group together, you form, you storm, you norm and you perform, right? And um, we did that in like three days, <laughs> um, which normally can take weeks. And I think it's because we work together so intensely and um, uh, and then work together throughout the day in the different virtual teams. Um, uh, so that was a pretty awesome, uh, it's been a pretty awesome experience. Our senior leadership team, I think, has really um, led the company here, though. Satya and his direct reports actually are meeting, have been meeting every day for weeks, even before it really hit the United States. And they've really led by example, I think, in the industry and in our local communities. And they focused on, like you have, you know, employees first and serving our, our customers, as well as, you know, the amount of donations that Microsoft has made. So it's been quite inspiring. Um, in a crisis, roadblocks are removed. Just that, like, that's one of the things, like, there's sometimes when you have to work across the company, priorities don't necessarily align, but man, just everything um, happened. Um, I've gotten to see the kitchens and the living rooms and the bedrooms and the kids and the dogs of, of many people, um, you know, my bosses, 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 and they've gotten to see ours. And so I think we've actually become, you know, closer as an executive uh, leadership team. Um, and uh, emojis, uh, you know, doing lots of emojis in the chat. Um, I find that I use Giphy multiple times, which is, you know, and add some fun and levity to uh, what we do. The other thing is that, um, you know, my team, I've gotten feedback from this virtual team is I try to start the day off with something super positive and celebrating something big from the day before. And I've had separate people say, I can't wait to get to, to the 830 meeting and hear the motivation for the day to help me, you know, go through because I'm tired and it's always uplifting. And so that's been that's been fun to be able to, to see that with the team. Yeah, actually, as someone who's I'm part of those 830 <laughs> meetings with you every morning. And are. yeah, those are those are kind of like the highlight of the day in my mind. Like those are those are meetings I think are, are useful and helpful. 
Okay, uh, we're gonna be wrapping up in a little bit here. Two last questions, both of them short. So tell us your favorite school moment that you've seen over the past couple of weeks. You've been talking with schools all across the US and world. Give us a couple of your favorite moments. Uh, the first one, uh, it's hard. There's so many. So um, I think Italy, it, Italy has been, you know, super inspiring. Um, you know, the University of Bologna shared how they went from, uh, you know, basically not doing anything online to uh, having 90% of their classes online within three days. Um, uh, you know, it's a 900 plus year old um, university, so they didn't want to miss uh, educating kids. They had they had teachers that they said we're using Office 97, folks. Office 97. The, then we're like three days teaching in teams. So how much bravery and grit and um, risk that they take those educators. So love them. Um, in Japan, an elementary school hosted its graduation in Minecraft. You know, they built a virtual assembly hall. They had their avatars. Just so inspiring, these kinds of stories that you hear. Um, there is a, a, a tweet from the Minister of Education in the United Emirates, and he's talking with these super cute little kids, you know, and talking to them about doing remote learning. And it was just such this precious moment. Um, you know, a special education teacher in Georgia telling me about how she found out she had like six hours to get ready and she was photocopying and using office lens to get ready. Um, and, and frankly, so many parents have reached out to me, um, you know, inside the Microsoft network or people that have contacted us through others and just to thank, thank us and send pictures of their kiddos uh, being so happy and uh, being able to connect. So that's just hearing the great stories is, is, is awesome. Yeah, no, uh, that, I agree. There's There's been some pretty amazing moments happening. So it's it's good to see when, when people rise up for the challenge. So the last one, this is a, so I've worked with Michelle, gosh, probably four years now. I, I'm not even sure. It's, it's been many years. And one of my most, I call it a legendary quote. This is a legendary Michelle moment and I want to get her take on it. So this is actually a few years ago and we were getting, uh, planning to switch over from uh, Microsoft Classroom into Microsoft Teams. And there's this meeting where there were some people who were preparing some things and the quote from Michelle was, uh, it seems like you've brought me a can't do plan. Uh, why don't you go back and think about it some more and come bring me a can do plan? And so uh, Michelle, I wanted you maybe to, to give a little insight into, into your thought process there. Yeah, so thanks Mike. So, you know, I'm always a glasses half full versus half empty and it's really easy, you know, I talked about a little bit earlier, it's really easy to come up with a plan that's a no, here's what can't work. Like, it's so easy to come up with that. It's when you stop and think back about what the possibility is. Um, and and this this came to me because I, I've done a lot of mentoring of startups, um, especially in the social innovation space. And I could look at someone's plan, their business plan, and poke holes in it all day long. And I would just deflate the person. And I'm like, that's not my job. My job is to, to find out what's the possibilities here um, and how we can move forward. And so I've always tried to look at everything that uh, people bring to me and rather than um, breaking it down into what's not possible, to focus on the what is possible and then to understand the rocks and the challenges that we'll have. But how do we how do we approach it from a yes, we can versus a no, we can't. So that's where it came from. Well, that's great. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And Michelle Thank you, actually has to, to, to rush off to some other uh, critical SLT related meetings, senior leadership team. So we'll let you get off to that. Thanks for joining us. Thank and you, everyone. Ne next up, we've got Jonathan Briggs, who is the chief technical officer at Eastside Preparatory School, which is actually, as Michelle said, sort of at least the original epicenter of, of COVID-19 in the United States uh, back about maybe a month ago when some of these cases started popping up. Uh, Jonathan's school was pretty close by. And, and so they've made a rapid shift to remote learning, probably maybe one of the first in the entire country. I, I don't even know. It was it was right up there, probably one of the first or if not the first. And so we wanted to have Jonathan on the show today and tell us a little bit about what's been happening. So Jonathan, Jonathan, first, I'll let you introduce yourself and just talk about your role briefly, and then I'll ask you a few questions. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jonathan Briggs. I'm the, um, I work at Eastside Preparatory School in Kirkland, so right down the street from the Evergreen Nursing Home where uh, we had an initial influx of COVID. 
Uh, we ended up started talking seriously about what would happen if we had to go remote on the 28th of February, I think. And we uh, shut down campus at about two o'clock on Monday, March 2nd and had everyone head out. And we were left with the, uh, the challenge of trying to train everyone on Teams via Teams uh, to deliver remote instruction. Um, and so we did a, a bit of a hybrid uh, to close out the, the term, which ended that Thursday. And then we were fully remote on the following Monday. Yeah, so that was a pretty large shift and very quickly uh, you shifted. I, I, it was funny, I remember we, we, you and I, I talked a little bit before any of the things were discovered at the, the Evergreen Center and the, the, um, the Kirkland Nursing Home. And you were already exploring and then everything happened over the weekend and all yep. of a sudden it was like, Whoop, okay, we're doing it right now. And so tell us a little bit about when, you know, talk about the size of, of what you change in terms of maybe give a sense to the number of teachers and how you rapidly manage that initial training with teams and, and sort of got people on board to what was a pretty new platform for many of them. Sure. Um, well, to start, I would say that the, um, the thing you need to look at in your school is what resources you have available. So I'm going to I'm about to list a whole bunch of resources that we have available that other schools may or may not have. Um, the question the it's not that you needed those particular set of resources, but whatever resources you have is your tool set to solve the problem. Um, so as I run through this, just keep in mind that if you don't have one of these things, that doesn't mean you can't uh, pull off a rapid shift to remote learning. Um, so as a school, we were already one to one laptops, uh, which made this a lot easier. We had already been uh, posting most of our class materials or almost all of our class materials in uh, a learning management system uh, called Canvas, and we were already fully on Office 365 uh, as a as a school. So for us, the only the decision when we went to uh, to remote learning was was really how do we get ourselves um, there quickly with teachers learning and students for that matter, learning only what is necessary to uh, complete this. Um, and the only missing piece for us at that point was teams. It was very different than a typical tech rollout where you're trying to sort of consolidate and make a smoother system for everyone and you might have months to plan and months to train people. Uh, we were we had to pull all of this off in about three days. Uh, so we were leveraging everything that we already did. So in terms of you, you've probably in the last couple of weeks got a lot of do's and don'ts. Like what are your top tips? Maybe there's not that many don'ts. Maybe there are. You probably had some, but what are your top do's and don'ts and tips that you could share with people who are maybe just getting into this rapidly? Well, I would echo what Michelle said about communication. I, I don't think it can be understated how much anxiety uh, shows up in the community when you are upending the way people work at home as parents and the way teachers work with their families and their work life uh, intermingled and students having to be online and something as simple as my webcam not working used to be a minor issue and now becomes a serious issue that we somehow have to mitigate. Uh, so we really, we our senior leadership team has also been meeting daily since February, uh, trying to figure out what is the, the best communication that we can deliver to people every day at a consistent time. So. Every day at about 530, there's a communication from us to the whole community and a separate communication to the faculty. Uh, and then we are constantly polling for feedback um, using multiple mechanisms. Some are just teams meetings, some are surveys and adjusting how we run the school on a weekly basis. Um, so that's my top do is to is to really over communicate. Uh, the other one is that the entire community of teachers and uh, software companies has been incredibly generous both with their time and their resources. Um, Microsoft upgraded some of our licenses so we could run team live events. Uh, we've been on the, the Teams channel for uh, remote learning uh, since the begin since it started, and that's been very helpful. And it's been felt really good for us to lend our expertise out to other schools who you know are a couple of weeks behind us in this process. Yeah, I know the community has been great for people who are the early adopters. For example, Eastside Prep uh, to help the people who are brand new to this and maybe a little frightened. Uh, this is maybe because you also are very technical and you're involved with the student information systems and school data sync. Without going into too many nuts and bolts details, can you talk to people a little bit about how you used school data sync and doing some of the rapid 
about the deployment work that you did. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, you know, there's a variety of ways to do it. We've talked to um, to some schools that just instructed teachers on how to create a team and have them put their rosters uh, directly in there. We had previously um, been exploring the school data sync tool, so we had a lot of that plumbing in place. And essentially, you can create a CSV. Uh, like an Excel spreadsheet essentially out of your learning man, I mean your uh, school information system and create a profile and then update it um, to school data sync and it'll essentially provision your entire school for you. Interestingly, the, the tech side was actually the probably the easiest part for us to implement. Uh, it was the, the training and the people side that was we spent the most time on. Um, it's pretty amazing what what is available and quickly deployable uh, these days. I don't think the world could have responded like this five years ago. Yeah. Well, in terms of you, you mentioned this in terms of just the teaching and learning and this, there's a whole new model that's that's being rolled out in real time. Can you share with people what have you observed just from teaching and learning at Eastside Prep? I mean, you were already doing cool things. I've been down there and visited many times, but obviously things are in a different mode now. So what are you observing? I think the, the feedback I'm getting from teachers is it's like your first year teaching all over again, uh, being on this in this mode. Um, and for those of you on listening who are teachers, you probably remember with a bit of fondness and a, a bit of trepidation that first year, which is just so grueling as you uh, figure out what it means to lead a class through experiences and um, assess students and so on. Um, so there's some excitement about that, like it feels fresh and vibrant again for people. And there's a lot of um, anxiety about it too. I think in our our school we have seasoned teachers that are really good at what they do and they're now in an environment where they know that what they're delivering is not at the same level that they could do in person, which makes sense. That's why we do school in person. Um, and so they are they are going through all the all the various ways that they can reach those same goals. So um, a simple example is just when you explain something and you look around the room and you look for head nods and confused looks, that's something that's very hard to do um, through an online format or something simple like uh, re-explaining something quickly to one student who doesn't quite understand the instructions. So this, our teachers are finding that it, they're most successful when they break students into small groups and they're spending extra time uh, really clearly defining instructions at a, at a level of detail that they wouldn't normally have to do. Um, in the classroom and uh, and they're learning a ton and I think you know whether or not they're learning quite as much algebra as they were before all the teachers and students are learning about you know modern uh, video conferencing tools and there's a lot of learning going on even if it's not all the subject that you're you're normally doing and I, I would add that I I think when we are done with this when we're all back in person all of our teachers will be armed with a whole new set of of skills and tools that they can make even more engaging classrooms. Yeah, no, I, it's interesting. I've I've read a lot of articles out there about OK, what's what's going to happen when we go back to normal? There's going to be a lot of societal changes that happen now that don't necessarily all flip back. And so it'll be sort of this interesting merge of things we bring back to quote the, the normal world that we've gotten used to in this, this whole new uh, fully digital world. So that should be interesting. Yeah, in we're terms really terms of, of oh, go ahead. I was going to say we're really excited to see once that once everything returns back to normal what what comes out you know when we look back at this period of time you know what what shifts have actually happened in the whole world whether it's education or whether it's even you know commerce or um, people being able to work more flexibly at home um, it's it's going to be an interesting thing to watch and if you take a step back from whatever anxiety might be out there it's a fascinating thing to to see evolve absolutely i agree so uh, last question on the student side and i don't know how many how many students you've had a chance to ask maybe privately or, or in small groups but what has been the student reaction to this new way of education um it is well i have two of them in my house so i've got ah. some kids going through the <laughs> process right now um they are uh they are finding that it's interesting to watch the teachers learn alongside of them how to make class better. Um, they say their their favorite classes are the teachers that take the constraints of this system and turn them into opportunities. So um, we're doing, you know, our school is doing everything from advisory to PE online right now um, to assemblies. 
So the, you know, we have some uh, teachers for P that say, look, in the next half hour, you need to go run somewhere and take a picture and upload it. And that's the way that they're doing PE now. Um, or we'll have uh, a Spanish teacher say, we're going to all break into six different channels and teams, and each of your channels needs to have a conversation. I'm going to drop in and, and interject there um, and things like that. So they are enjoying that. It's actually exhausting. So we've built in um, built in intentional breaks so that students have half an hour here and there to to get off of the, the screen. It's exhausting for us as adults um, just to maintain a focus on the screen that whole time. Uh, so we're really intentional about that and we are continuing to take feedback and tweaking it. None of us are under the illusion that, you know, we could spend three days imagining how this would go and come up with the perfect solution. So we we have a cadence of just every week. This is how it's going to change and we're expecting it to change again next week. Yeah, and just like Michelle said, whatever you're doing this week likely will change again next week as you learn yep. and as you go along. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. And again, Jonathan Briggs here, probably uh, one of the first schools in the nation that shifted to remote learning in, on a dime. And so uh, I think Jonathan probably gets a good amount of credit to help drive that change quickly. So thank you for joining us today. And other than that, uh, any last words before we switch back to our little wrap up? Uh, just over support your teachers. They uh, they will need it and they will appreciate it. Um, let them know that you've got their back. Great. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for joining us today. And I'm going to uh, get the screen back here just for a little wrap up. In ter terms of our key resources, we've got the Microsoft Learning Remote Learning Site, the Teams EDU Quick Start Guide, and then again, the link to our remote learning community. Also, today's PowerPoint that is, well, this PowerPoint today uh, wasn't as rich as some of the other ones because we mainly did interviews, but some of the links are in here. That will be posted later today at this link here. We also have that YouTube playlist that I talked about, so this webinar will be posted on that playlist in about, oh, by tomorrow morning probably. And any support ticket or help you need, be sure to file a support ticket at the link below right there. And then next up, uh, we're taking a break tomorrow, but on Monday, we've got uh, David Olinger and, and Manny Sandu from the Teams group. They're going to talk about how to set up Teams and how they moved it to an online conferencing platform. We've got Shay Harris from our education engagement team and Magnus Santorb doing one of the largest scale Teams deployments in the world. They've done some amazing work out in Norway. And then on Wednesday, we've got Holly Clark and Matt Miller, I'm going to talk about a new education partnership that Microsoft has with the two of them. And the full schedule is in the link below if you want to see we're adding, we're already booked out to like April 14th. So we're we're adding guests uh, on a rapid clip. And also a big shout out to uh, Maryline Hoekstra, who's been our producer behind the scenes, as well as Matt Whitehead. Maryline's going to be helping, uh, helping us do these shows on a regular basis. So thank you so much for all your help, Maryline. And we will see you soon.